Hello everyone, we're back again with another critique video today on the channel. We have Dr. Karan, dumbest health trend of 2024, CGM, which stands for Continuous Glucose Monitor. So, can't wait to get into this one. I have not watched it, 12 minutes and 32 seconds. Really not looking forward to it, but hey, this is what I do. This is my job now. It's amazing, isn't it? Anyway, we're just going to jump directly into this. But first, of course, just like always, please subscribe to the Patreon if you haven't already to gain access to one week early uploads, ad-free content, uncensored content, and one extra video per week, and also buy my book Contraindicated if you have not already. And with that being said, now we can jump directly into this video. Health influencers have found a brand new wellness trend. Continuous glucose monitoring. Continuous glucose monitor. Continuous glucose monitor. Are these glucose monitoring gizmos really all- Okay, so already, right now, we can already sort of infer the veracity of the information that we are going to be told here. That That's all that I will say. That is all that I will say. Okay, j j just prepare yourself cracked up to be? Or could those blood sugar spikes you've heard so much about not quite be the biological boogeyman you've been led to believe? And well, when you say boogeyman, you necessarily are implying that it is manufactured, and it's not. Okay, they are dangerous. Blood sugar spikes are not indicated whatsoever for any human, by the way. Anybody. Okay. Glucose is a six carbon aldehyde. It is an aldohexose. And aldehydes, even in vastly small concentrations, destroy lipid rafts, tear cell membranes to pieces, bind to DNA, and actively mutate it, and in a high enough concentration will kill a cell outright. Aldehydes are typically lipid peroxidation products, and they have been shown to do such a thing. Whether glucose damages cells because of its aldehyde functional group, I'm not quite sure. However, I find it very coincidental that both of them are aldehydes, and both of them destroy cells via the same mechanism, that being covalent binding to proteins. Either way, they basically function as aldehydes, so treat them as such. The only way to get a glucose spike is by consuming glucose, by the way. That is the only way to have a glucose spike. He changed my life. Well, he said that he had been tracking his blood sugar for weeks and that he was learning how the foods that he was eating, they were high in sugar. Well, to answer that question, I'm going to run a simple experiment on myself. I'm going to wear this continuous glucose monitor, the CGM, and use it to compare my glucose response to two different foods. One undeniably healthy, a luscious red apple, and the other- No, that is den- <laughs> Wow. Apples are contraindicated for human consumption. They always have been. They're first of all a human invention in terms of their size and, and, and taste today and the amount of variations that you have. They've been hybridized to be sweeter and juicier. They're full of uh, sucrose, which is just a disaccharide between glucose and fructose. They're full of glucose. They're full of fructose as well. They're full of sorbitol. All of those are a problem via glycation. Fructose is seven to ten times more glycating than that of glucose. Sucrose, well, if it has fructose in it, then you're going to have fructose and glucose bomb right there. You've also got fiber in it. An apple, by the way, which is another contraindication. Check out my fiber playlist. It only has about three videos, and that's because that's all that there requires. Fiber is abrasive to the enteric nervous system, and therefore subsequently increases mucus secretion because of immune dysregulation that increases. That's just a little taste. There's far more about fiber. Go check out that playlist. It's just ridiculous. Also, sorbitol has an osmotic force, so when it increases in concentration in high blood sugar events, which it absolutely does, it can basically cause your cells to burst. Now, this can happen to every single one of your cells, but cells within the retina, the kidney, and the nerves actually have a naturally low level of sorbitol dehydrogenase, the enzyme responsible for breaking down sorbitol. Just so happens that the most common side effects of diabetes is retinopathy, neuropathy, and nephropathy, at least the first ones as well. So, interesting. Don't eat apples. Okay? Okay. Well, you know. And we'll see which one is the best for me based on the glucose spike it provokes. Now okay, so this is already based on a false notion that if a food does not stimulate a spike in blood glucose, that therefore it's indicated and at least totally benign and innocuous for human consumption. False. Okay, seed oils don't cause a spike in blood sugar. Okay, blood glucose effects are not the criterion of health. Blood glucose responses from a food is not the criterion of health with respect to the criteria that would have to be met in order for a food to be able to be deemed healthy. Which, by the way, is a construct and therefore would be an opinion anyway, but anyway. Take a look at those readings. I ate an apple and this fried chicken hot wing, and which one would you assume gave me the biggest spike? So what? Who cares? You shouldn't be eating either of them. Okay, just because something doesn't spike your blood sugar doesn't mean that it should be consumed. Okay, this is already under a false notion. It's a, it, This is an operation under a false notion here. Already. That's right. 
it's the apple. To just look at these readings, you'd have to conclude that this piece of fruit with its fiber, water, and vitamins was worse for me than this ultra-processed fried chicken with its- Not worse for you per se, because that implies that something that actually grants you and stimulates a higher glucose response via your blood glucose level is therefore more unhealthy than KFC. Healthy being a construct, by the way, it's an idea, it's, it's an opinion, really is what we should say. But even if you place the word healthy with indicated, still it's false, okay? It's still false. Anything that causes an increase in blood glucose level in a spike fashion is not indicated, though, by the way. It's not, because that phenomenon isn't indicated. If I just wanted to entertain the idea here, I would probably say that it may have to do with the fact that KFC is high in fat and protein, which can blunt the glucose spike. Apples just have fiber, anyway and fat. They say doctors don't get much nutrition training, but the answers don't quite add up here. Well, even if they did, the training that they would be given is completely erroneous and fraudulent, so if anything, it's probably a good thing they don't get as much. This is the problem with CGMs. They only tell you about one thing. Glucose. Yes, exactly. However, a continuous glucose monitor is still something that can help people, diabetics, with managing their blood glucose levels. Here's the thing. If you are not diabetic, there is no reason to have a continuous glucose monitor. Just don't do it unless you just want to do it for curiosity's sake. And there's no problem with that, but it's really unnecessary. If you're not consuming carbohydrates, there's no need. The only time that I can even think of it being a good idea is if you are worried about how much protein you're consuming in one bolus as a carnivore, but anyway. Spikes, which by the way, are a perfectly normal response to eating just about anything. Like most- Okay, so here is the problem here. You used the word normal, which depending on what you mean by normal is correct. It is a normal response. It's the pedant in me, but I would actually tend to believe that he's correct in saying that it's normal. Normal is not synonymous with indicated though. Yes, it is normal for people to exhibit blood glucose spikes postprandially, meaning after you eat. That does not mean it's indicated, okay? It's also normal for people to be overweight and obese in this country, in the world actually. Okay. That's not indicated though. Glucose spikes are indicative of damage occurring in the blood from glucose via glycation of albumin and hemoglobin particularly. Okay? You should not ever exhibit and present with a glucose spike ever. Okay? Really what what's better to say, what's more appropriate to say is that you should never consume carbohydrates. You should present with a glucose spike if you've consumed glucose because that's exactly what the body's supposed to do. So glucose spikes aren't pathology. The pathology is carbohydrate consumption. In life, our health depends on much more than one factor. But if correct glucose spikes were as important as influencers and celebrity doctors tell us, do you even have any control over them in the first place? Yes, you do. By not consuming f***ing glucose, sir. You might be surprised to find out. Let's play a quick game. Which of these do you think can impact your blood glucose? The amount of sleep you've had, how much exercise you're doing, your levels of stress, periods of illness, or whether you're menstruating or not. The answer- All of them... Covered that? All of them. And if there's that's the other thing. That's also why the glycemic index is complete nonsense. The whole construct that will tell you, supposedly, how much higher your blood glucose will spike, or really, how much higher of an ability a food has to stimulate a glucose spike as compared to another one, which is just complete nonsense because there's no way that you can actually determine what one person's glucose response will be to the same food because that depends on all the things that he just listed right there. So let alone trying to determine that for an entire population. To make it really simple, stop consuming the thing that is not necessary for human consumption and is actively damaging above a physiological level. I just covered this in an Abby Sharp video. Abby Sharp is a bowling ball, really. One thing you should take away from this video, it's that blood glucose is like a moody teenager, affected by everything and impossible to understand what's really making it act up. Correct, but the degree to which it will fluctuate is much, much lower, as it should be if one is not consuming carbohydrates. A metabolic toxin. Okay, okay. Imagine being a new mother. You've been up all night, feeding your tiny human, and you're shattered. Your partner's gone to work, and now you're left alone with a screaming gremlin who even Super Nanny would probably hand an iPad to. You're exhausted and stressed, and in a fit of madness, you decide to throw a CGM into the mix because some influencer on TikTok is doing the same. And what a surprise. You've registered a massive glucose spike. And that's indicated after breakfast have actually no sorry no 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 don't eat a breakfast that causes a glucose spike you may have elevated blood glucose and you may have a significant glucose response sure not exactly a massive spike that's indicated that's appropriate the body is depending on gluconeogenesis to produce glucose which means that it will only produce glucose in the exact required amounts at that given instance in time it can become supply driven if you over consume protein it can cause issues but anyway 
possibly know which of the factors I just mentioned, including the guilt you feel for pacifying your infant with a screen, are causing the spike. It's impossible to say. There's absolutely no, no. The very thing that caused the spike was the food, sir. The massive spike you're referring to in this hypothetical example is caused by the food. Thing you can do to prevent your blood sugar spiking in response to the events I just mentioned. So there's absolutely no point worrying about them. Yet wearing so no, you should worry about glucose spikes because it's indicative of you consuming carbohydrates, which is a pathology. The consumption of carbohydrates is the pathology at hand with respect to type two diabetes and all that nonsense. Okay will be nothing but a constant reminder of just how spiky your glucose is. And this really should not be spiky though. It should not be that desultory. To the heart of the problem with healthy people wearing CGMs. Physical health is the result of a complex array of interacting factors, some of which correct like our genes, are not even under our control. Actually, they are under your control. With very few genetic manifestations, they are not under your control. This is pleiotropy. This is a myth, basically, that the genes that you're born with have a certain effect down the line on your health, which completely fails to mention the fact that genes are responsible for encoding for the production of a certain protein and nothing else, and actually respond to your environment. They are either activated, deactivated, or somewhere in between with respect to the production of that protein with respect to external stimuli. One of those stimuli being what you eat, the others being how you behave and act in the real world, physical activity and the types, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. You do have control over your genes. For example, there are about eight to 10, maybe 11 oncogenes that are required to be activated in order for someone to develop cancer. But someone can be born with all 10 of them and not have them be activated and therefore will not develop cancer. So anyway possible to measure all of these factors. Instead, we prefer to collapse all that nuance into a single number. Right, and that's another reason why I'm not a huge fan of CGMs. So why don't you just not buy a CGM and just stop consuming the glucose? Because that's the pathology at hand. Glucose. Because it's easy to measure, and we end up giving that number way more significance than it really deserves. Yes, it's true that what gets measured gets managed, and blood pressure is a perfect example of that. But at the other end of that spectrum, we have Goodhart's Law, which tells us when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. It's good. It's true. I actually just covered this in a video that I just got done recording about the good, the bad, and the ugly of the carnivore diet. Yeah, great. However, we do know that a spike in blood glucose, a massive spike, is deleterious and actively damaging. So, anyway. Imagine a hospital was given a target so all of its patients who walked in through its doors were seen by a doctor within 10 minutes. Sounds good, right? That's really putting the patient first. Well, it might seem like that on the surface, but what about when the hospital's understaffed? When an emergency is happening? What if the number of patients attending the hospital goes up by a quarter? Then the only way the staff can meet the target is by rushing through consultations or procedures and compromising patient care. Focusing solely on a single measure in isolation can lead to all sorts of perverse outcomes, and that sums up blood glucose measurements in healthy people to a T. We've all encountered- Right, except for the fact that, once again, a glucose spike is in every single situation contraindicated and insalubrious and deleterious for human physiology, okay? We're not talking about little, like, things like that, okay? We're talking about spikes because that represents glucose pooling in the blood, that glucose causing glycation via covalent binding to albumin, hemoglobin, and the cells lining the vasculature, arteries, and to a lesser extent, the veins. Not indicated. ...calorie counters or step counters who become so fixated on reaching their arbitrary goal, they lose sight of the forest for the trees. If you can't eat... So I understand that your analogy... Your analogy is a good one. It is a good one. It's a good analogy. However, it does not change the fact that no one should be sustaining glucose spikes. Ever. ...anything without first worrying about your glucose response to it. Are you denying yourself your favorite food even occasionally? And what impact is that device really having on your life? Remember too that one guaranteed way of flattening a glucose curve is to eat high fat foods or drastically reduce your consumption of carbohydrates. Did yes, reduce it to zero. That's optimal. And also increase your fat intake. Sure. Yes, absolutely. It just has to be the indicated fat, that being saturated fat or what is colloquially deemed saturated fat, so straight hydrocarbon chains, biochemically speaking, butter, tallow, lard, suet, and ghee, the stuff solid at room temperature. I say colloquially deemed saturated fat because actually beef fat is not mostly saturated. It's mostly monounsaturated. And same thing with lard.
Despite what you may hear on TikTok, carbs are not your enemy. Yes, they absolutely are nonsense. They are contraindicated for human consumption. They are unnecessary for human consumption first and foremost, and above a physiological concentration within the blood, which can only be attained really by consuming carbohydrates because that will cause it to be a supply-driven glucose response, and glucose concentration within the blood does absolutely cause damage, will cause damage, okay? False. Why would we take health advice from you? Sir, from my understanding, you're a doctor, so you have no business giving any nutrition advice whatsoever. And just to make sure, because I could be very, very wrong here, and I will own up to it immediately if I am. A general surgeon in the NHS, that is what he is, a general surgeon. So, were you trained and or have you had any private reviewing and studying and research done with respect to human nutrition, biochemistry, human physiology? No, at least not sufficient. Because if you did, you'd understand that carbohydrates should not be consumed ever. Unless you were in the woods and the only food available was an apple or something. And if you didn't eat that, you would starve to death. Well, there you go. Eat it. It's easy to see how obsessing over CGM readings could lead to people eating all sorts of unbalanced diets just so their blood glucose... Um, who says that balance is supposed to be had within a diet? Can you name me one animal within the wild that actually exhibits balance with respect to the eating and consumption of their diet? No. Also, here's another fun fact, here's another fun question to pose to you. Can you, sir, bring me an animal from the woods and bring me another animal of that exact same species and put it right next to the one that you just grabbed with any species of animal and demonstrate that they are eating two different diets? Turns out you can't do that, actually. It's not possible because they all eat the same species-appropriate, species-specific diet. Every single animal with respect to diet is a specialist. We are no different in that respect. We are different from other animals, but only in one respect, actually. It's with respect to our ability to reason. Every single other reason that you may think we are different from other animals is subsidiary and ancillary to that reason. Everything. Civilization, speech, all of it. Stop consuming carbohydrates. Balanced diets, actually, ones that consist of a significant amount of carbohydrates and a significant amount of fat, are the most dangerous diets known to man, actually. Second to that is veganism, but anyway. Levels stay low. I can see two potential negative outcomes from this. One, I can imagine seeing individuals with deranged blood lipid profiles from eating- Nope, blood lipid profiles with respect to what you mean by deranged are not deranged. Okay, that is based on normative levels of the population first and foremost, but also that is based upon fraudulent data that purports to show unequivocally and unambiguously that cholesterol and any of the lipoproteins, LDL, HDL, any of those, are atherogenic. One plus or minus one percent of atherosclerotic plaque is constituted of cholesterol and is largely composed of scar tissue that can become calcified at later stages, become unstable in rupture, then causing thrombi, which are blood clots. One should refer to the largest associative data set ever aggregated from the British Heart Foundation and the World Health Organization working independently from each other, wherein they measured the total and estimated the LDL levels of people in 168 different countries. These were several hundred million data points around the world. And on the other axis, plotted the age-adjusted death rates per 100,000 persons per year versus their cholesterol level. And what they found was that the lower your total cholesterol level was, below 220 milligrams per deciliter, the higher the incidence of deaths were from all causes and from every sub-cause, including heart disease, strokes, and cancer. Now, you will also see a trend upward in the incidence rates as well. Pro seeking 220 milligrams per deciliter, but that is actually not the consequence of actual collected data. That is the consequence of selecting a line of best fit for the data that actually was collected. There wasn't that much data collected that showed people with cholesterol levels proceeding to 20. There are some, of course, but not that many. And there are explanations for why cholesterol levels could present higher within someone that is about to die or is presenting with deadly conditions because cholesterol is responsible for healing the body. It makes up 50% of every single one of the cell membranes within the trillions of cells within your body, every single one invariably. It makes up the backbone of all of your steroid hormones, basically five major hormone groups, really, progestogens, androgens, mineral glucocorticoids, glucocorticoids, and estrogens. It is responsible for maintaining cell membrane fluidity by making your cell membranes more resilient and more resistant to malleability, let's say, and give Okay. If LDL itself, which is not cholesterol, it's a lipoprotein that carries cholesterol through the body, or cholesterol or any of the lipoproteins were causal in heart disease, you would see atherosclerosis occur in veins as well as arteries, and they do not because they carry the exact same blood with respect to the cholesterol content, and they do not occur in both, or it does not occur in both. Not only that, you can predict the sites where heart disease will develop, which just so happens to be the same sites where the most turbulence occurs with respect to blood flow. We're done. 
cholesterol, and or any of the lipoproteins do not cause heart disease. We're done. Heart disease is an inflammatory condition characterized by oxidation and glycation of SDLDL and other LDL particles, and also, most importantly, hypertension, which is most conducively caused and auspiciously caused by being inflamed in the first place, because there will be vasodilation in the areas that are inflamed and vasoconstriction in the main parts of the vasculature to provide more blood to those vasodilated areas. We're done high fat diets, which exposes them to all sorts of negative cardiovascular health outcomes. Nope, there is no evidence to support that claim, especially considering the fact that inferential statistics, that being human nutrition science, at least one of the subsidiary elements of it, has no ability to inform upon causality whatsoever. And if people knew that, then 99.99% of all health information and influencer nonsense on all of social media would not exist. Second, I worry that obsessive use of CGMs and a fixation on an arbitrary number and the demonization of carbohydrates. Okay, but you just showed a picture on the screen of 254 milligrams per deciliter. That's insane. That is absolutely deleterious in particular could lead to disordered eating behaviors. Define disordered eating because you don't know what it is, I would suspect, considering the fact that you just put restrictive eating on there and we all know what your implications are right there. That cutting out carbohydrates, an absolute unnecessary nutrient, nutrient, toxin, as well as a deleterious compound is somehow restrictive. It's not restrictive. Compulsive eating, you know the best way to actually effectuate an eating disorder such as compulsive eating, such as binging and restricting, binging and restricting, actual restricting of any exogenous intake of food is by having them consume carbohydrates because they're addictive and fattening. Not necessarily fattening, but it is the most conducive way to effectuating a fat storage situation and an overweight and obese status, considering the fact that overweight statuses and obese statuses are a hormonal dysregulation problem. It has nothing to do with calories, which you can't f***ing consume anyway. Frankly, I wouldn't wish on anyone. If all of that isn't enough to convince you to think- Well, that's sweet. It's about wearing one of these stress patches. Just wait till you find out how inaccurate they are in the first place. Let me tell you- They can be inaccurate, by the way, because they actually are not administered into the blood. It doesn't read your blood glucose. It reads the glucose levels within your interstitial fluid, so it can actually be impacted by the activity that one is engaging in, such as taking a hot shower, which can increase your pulse rate, therefore increasing the rate at which glucose passes by that monitor, leading to an incorrect reading, an inaccurate reading. Just stop using CGMs and just stop Stop consuming the carbohydrates. We're done. That now. CGMs don't actually measure the glucose in your blood. Correct. They measure glucose in the interstitial fluid. The Correct. Seth, and that's the fluid between cells. The problem with this is that glucose levels in the interstitial fluid tend to change slower than a tortoise getting out of bed much more slowly than glucose levels change in blood vessels, and this causes a lag between the two. In other words, what you see on a CGM may not be the real amount of glucose in your capillaries. Right, so don't use a CGM and just cut the carbohydrates. How big that difference can be, let's take a look at this graph. The continuous black line shows the interstitial fluid readings taken by CGM, while the dots are the actual blood glucose levels. You can see how big the difference between the two is sometimes. Quite frankly, the CGM readings here are misleading. Now it's true the per- Correct. The question here was exercising so intensively they needed to consume carbs while exercising. Nope, there is no such thing as a necessary requirement for exogenous introduction of carbohydrates, even during exercise. Gluco, neo, Genesis, okay? And this is what probably caused the large variation in glucose levels. Perhaps you're thinking, well, I don't do anything like that kind of exercise, so if I use a CGM, it should be more accurate. Well, you'll be pleased to hear that you have more in common with elite athletes than you think. When a group of participants aged between 60 and 85, so hardly professional sports people, have their blood glucose tested with either a CGM, a finger stink instrument, or the gold standard laboratory test, not only was the CGM the least accurate of the three, but it underestimated the increase in blood glucose for eight hours after finishing a meal. So as both of these stuff So what? Show, you cannot assume that what CGM show you really is an accurate reading of your blood glucose. Right, okay, so stop using a CGM and just stop consuming the carbohydrates. Is this really my video here? I'm constantly amazed at how I get to sit in front of a f***ing camera and just simply react to a video and look at the camera and go, don't eat carbs, guys. This is what I do? Really? Give me something else. Even if they did, would that be enough to tell us everything we wanted to know about our overall health? No, it wouldn't, and I already covered that in the beginning. Blood glucose levels, as well as weight, as well as muscle mass, those aren't the criteria of health, or the exclusive criteria. It is a multifaceted situation and construct, because that's what health is. It is a construct. It's an idea. 
I'm going to explain blood glucose is simply the tip of the iceberg when it comes to overall health and like the Titanic steaming into an ice. Well, that's an opinion because where you put blood glucose on your hierarchy of health is going to differ from person to person in terms of what they believe to be the most salient and significant with respect to health. We ignore other biomarker icebergs at our peril. To listen to some CGM zealots. Okay, we, we don't care about biomarkers in this space because those are also constructs. Those do not necessarily inform upon health, or at least pathology presence is what we should say. You'd think that monitoring your blood glucose was the be all and end all of human health. Or portending certain pathologies to develop later on in life, by the way. I'm saying that because he brought up LDL and lipids. You'd think that monitoring your blood glucose was the be all and end all of human health. Some people would be led to believe that because of how many influencers are talking about it. It is, in my opinion, a problem. Just cut the carbs, you won't have to deal with glucose responses like that that are deleterious thing could be further from the truth. If your doctor suspects you may be at risk of any kind of underlying metabolic disorder, they may well measure your blood glucose. However, they'll also be interested in your blood pressure, your weight, your family history of diabetes, and blood pressure is a better indicator other lifestyle factors, such as whether you smoke or drink or how much exercise you do. It's the combination of the Yep, yeah, but of course not the kind of exercise you do, which is arguably just as important, if not more factors that increases someone's probability of developing type 2 diabetes. But be honest. Well, type 2 diabetes is a disease characterized by chronically elevated blood glucose caused by carbohydrate consumption. You cannot find someone that has type 2 diabetes that does not consume carbohydrates. It's not possible. Just so you know that. That has a genuine, bona fide, pathological presence of elevated blood glucose. Spike trough, spike trough, spike trough. And then eventually, of course, with diabetes, it's spike mm, trough. How many fitness influencers out there encourage you to check your blood pressure or waist measurement as often as they check their blood glucose? Good point. Well, with respect to blood pressure, I hear many people talking about weight to height ratio or waist to height ratio. About as many of them that post content of themselves without filters. Don't forget, so-called glucose spikes are part of our body's natural response to certain foods. Okay, so here is your sort of furtive, tacit, nonchalant implication insertion here. That being that you should be having glucose spikes after you consume food, which is false. You should be having them if you consume carbohydrates, yes, because that's what the body is designed to do when consuming carbohydrates. The problem is that we know that a glucose spike is indicative of damage occurring because glucose within the bloodstream at that high of a level causes damage via glycation, and we also know that glucose is unnecessary for human consumption, and so, well, there you have your pathology right there, which is glucose consumption and carbohydrate consumption in the first place, because Fructose also instigates and stimulates glycation seven to ten times more than glucose. Fructose is also metabolized differently than glucose, and from my understanding, at least it has been suggested, it may have been proven, but I know that it at least has been suggested, that it actually starts to drain the purine pools, or the purine pool, in your cells because of the buildup of AMP in the biochemical process of fructose metabolism, which needs to be excreted because that disrupts the equilibrium of ATP creation and all that, and then it creates IMP via AMP deaminase, and in order to create IMP, you take off off an amino group which forms NH4 plus and that goes to create urea and that's when you get this whole thing about uric acid which is urate really and that's why fructose is known to be a cause of increased uric acid which is also predicated upon the myth that uric acid is the cause of gout which it's not so anyway Dr. Peter Tia, one of the most prominent proponents of CGMs himself. Peter Tia is a knucklehead. Those are his own words actually. Like I'm a knucklehead. I mean I know a lot about lipids for a knucklehead, but I'm talking about like the smartest people in the world are the ones you need to be talking to on this topic. I didn't say that. He did. Okay. He doesn't understand lipid metabolism either. Which is there is no scientific data showing the use of CGM leads to long-term health benefits in people. There is no evidence within the field of inferential statistics and therefore human nutrition science that shows any relation, causal relation, between any externality, dietary or lifestyle-wise, as that relates to any presentation of any pathology or health outcome ever. Over any given period of time, throughout the entire time, inferential statistics and human nutrition science has existed. There never has been and there never will be. In order to establish a cause and effect relationship, 
relationship such as that. You have to take two genetically identical twins, both phenotypically and genotypically identical, separate them at birth, put them into two metabolic ward lock-in rooms, observe them over their entire lives of attempting to infer lifelong health outcomes, 40 years for 40 year long health outcomes, etc., and control for every single variable, including the time they wake up, the time they go to bed, their stress levels, their hormone levels, the time they eat, etc., etc. It's implausible for obvious reasons, but it's also unethical, wouldn't get past an ethics committee, rightfully so, and is also exorbitantly expensive. There's no data to support that at all, correct. But that goes for every single thing, including the whole LDL lipid heart hypothesis that you just posited earlier and put forth as fact who don't have type 2 diabetes. Okay, is there a randomized controlled trial demonstrating the- There are no randomized controlled trials of any significance whatsoever. They don't go on long enough, and I just covered why. They're often not randomized, hardly at all, or at least properly, and they're not controlled. Unequivocally, they are not controlled. They can't be. It's either you control or you don't control. There is no in-between of CGM in anything outside of patients with diabetes, there is not. More than this, one of the major CGM providers acknowledging on its own website that brief infrequent glucose spikes may actually be beneficial for our bodies than a consistently flat glucose curve. As it's so often the case, it's the dose that makes the poison, although- Right, and what is the dose with respect to glucose consumption? Anything above absolute zero, because no amount of exogenous carbohydrates are required to subserve the life of a human being. Don't rely on this as a defense in court. And I've covered the dose makes the poison issue on multiple occasions. I did so with Miss Scientific Snitch, which isn't a scientist. She is a little girl that plays with test tubes and likes to think of herself as a scientist. And I also covered it with respect to Lane Norton. Not directly with a video, but it was in another video where I mentioned that Lane Norton is one of these people that says the dose makes the poison with respect to glucose consumption, with respect to plant toxins, and with respect to industrial waste products such as cyanide that can be found in processed meats. Well, that's great. The dose does make the poison. What is the dose, Lane? What is the f***ing dose? Well, actually, it turns out that the dose, in terms of indication, is anything above absolute zero, because none of those things are required for human consumption to subserve the life of a human being, exogenously speaking. None. Some people are just not very smart. This really can't be said loudly. Or objective. And this really can't be said loudly enough. There is nothing in the medical literature to suggest that glucose spikes in healthy individuals are anything to worry about. The Absolutely, fundamentally ridiculous, sir. In terms of medical literature, what you're referring to is human nutrition science. With respect to biochemistry, we do know that glucose above a physiological concentration within the blood does cause damage to albumin and globulin, globulins. Glucose within a cell also above a certain concentration will destroy that cell. Okay? I already covered what glucose does. That's biochemistry. So let me get this straight. There is no requirement for exogenous carbohydrates in human beings. They actively spike glucose if consumed to a significant enough degree, which therefore also subsequently causes damage first and foremost, but also causes a commensurate, or sort of commensurate, actually more than is required, secretion of insulin from the pancreas, which is an anabolic hormone, meaning building up and storing things, not just muscle, but also fat. It is required for fat storage. By the way, insulin is is required for fat storage. You cannot store fat or create fat, by the way. You cannot create fatty acids without insulin, okay? So then there's another effect of that that is not ideal, typically. People would express that that's not ideal for them. So why the f are you saying that glucose spikes are not problematic? They have not been established unequivocally and unambiguously with respect to inferential statistics to unequivocally and unambiguously lead to poor health outcomes if someone on a quotidian basis presents with multiple glucose spikes because that is dependent on a myriad of different factors as well as, for example, their genetics and what they're more predisposed genetically to developing given a set stimulus or set of stimuli. But we do know that glucose spikes are deleterious. They do involve the induction of damage, the incurring and sustaining of damage by tissues of the body. We do know that. The idea that we should be worried about glucose spikes and CGMs are the answer. You should be worried and concerned about glucose spikes because that is indicative of pathology occurring. What is that pathology? Carbohydrate consumption built on quicksand. And as I'm about to explain, it's not just that it's a faulty idea, I think CGMs are even worse than that. An entire industry has grown up around CGMs these last few years as part of the personalized diet trend we're seeing, and it's virtually impossible to go online on social media and not see some- Glucose revolution, yeah, yeah, glucose goddess, I've done a video on her before. She's also one of these people that understands the damage of glucose and, and all carbohydrates really to speak of, actually. She's someone has said that orange juice can be worse than Coca-Cola with respect to a blood glucose response. She's 
absolutely correct. In fact, there's even more sugar in orange juice oftentimes, especially the worst kind, which is fructose, than Coca-Cola. But she's also one of these people that will simultaneously say that, and then in the same breath say, so in order to prevent the glucose spike, continue consuming the glucose, but just consume other things that will prevent the spike. It's just nonsense. She also doesn't understand the Randall cycle. She's a biochemist, and yet she doesn't understand the Randall cycle. Insulin resistance, though. <sighs> Goodness singing their praises or some company offering expensive programs to help with this. It's got to the point now that you can even buy anti-glucose spike pills. You yeah, instead of just not consuming the f***ing thing that causes the spike in the first place. It's amazing. That is a scam. He's absolutely correct. Some CGM fanatics who proudly masquerade their concerns about your glucose spikes are actually encouraging you to eat junk food on the basis that all will be well. Junk food, such as fiber, actually, sir. Which, of course, you'd say is not junk food at all. Yeah, fiber is one contraindication in the human diet. As long as you take their magic pill, only 40 pounds a month. Correct. There you go. As long as you sign up to their monthly subscription. I mean, why not just save your money and eat less junk food? This is a really... Yeah, exactly. And, and here, here's the here's the thing. Or just, of course, not consume carbohydrates. But here's the thing. I endorse and am an affiliate with one company that sells products. One. But I do not sit here in front of this camera and say, continue perpetuating your bad habits and maintaining them. Just take your stem enhance. Just take your stem enhance, guys. No. If you are not on a properly tenured and properly fortified carnivore diet yet, do not take Cerule if you are someone that is not dealing with something that is characteristic by immense amounts of inflammation. If you were someone that is dealing with immense amounts of inflammation, I would tell you to do both. I would never ever tell someone to not change their diet first. Change your diet to a species appropriate, species specific diet. ...situation to be in. It's hard to imagine any other health marker becoming so popular to measure in healthy individuals as this has. Okay, but what causes people to become what is colloquially deemed unhealthy with respect to blood glucose levels? constant spiking and troughing of the glucose from consuming carbohydrates. <sighs> wow. Out, I'd even be making these videos if it weren't for the influencers and marketing experts out there who are responsible for convincing so many people to spend money on CGMs. And don't forget, they aren't cheap. CGM costs... No, they are not. They are hundreds of dollars, sometimes hundreds of dollars a month. It is ridiculous easily run into the hundreds or even thousands of pounds per year. I mean, I had to spend 80 pounds on this thing just for the sake of this video, and it's only for a two-week trial. Two-week trial. Ridiculous. Well, as the monitor itself, you need the breathable sensor tape and the waterproof sensor covers as well. Well, why bother with financial stability when you could have a cupboard full of miracle cures and snake oil accessories? Let's be clear on one thing. There are people out there making a lot of money from selling products and supplements to healthy people in order to control a natural physiological reaction on the basis- It is a natural physiological reaction. However, a spiking of glucose is indicative of damage occurring with respect to the glucose that was consumed, which means that the pathology present is actually the glucose being consumed in the first place, which should be abstained from. Cover that fear on the basis that you should be afraid of the way your body naturally works to me this is nothing more well, than that's silly that's absolutely silly sir that is not what they say actually it's not that you should be afraid of how your body works when you get fat and you say to yourself well i want to monitor my weight in the forms of fat and water and i want to monitor it and make sure that it's going down as i start to implement new healthy indicated dietary behavior that is not being afraid of how your body works okay what you're saying is well well your body works by uh having a glucose glucose spike when you consume glucose. So therefore, since it's how your body is supposed to work, uh, you should continue consuming the glucose. That's ridiculous. You know, when you eat enough glucose, it's stored as fat and you'll get fatter and fatter over time, especially if you eat glucose and fat together. Randall cycle. Okay, that's how your body is supposed to work. Does that mean you should continue eating fat and glucose together? <laughs> the hell is that logic? Scam. Maybe the problem begins with... Oh, I'm getting fat. Well, that's just what your body's supposed to do. So keep doing it. To me, this is nothing more than a marketing scam. Maybe the problem begins with companies and certain well-known individuals, but it quickly gets blown out of proportion by ill-informed influencers who either haven't done their research or are simply out- Don't tell us who has and has not done their research, and especially who has done it and who has not done it properly and responsibly. You just brought up the lipid heart hypothesis as fact. A quick buck or both. But does that mean there's no one out there apart from diabetes sufferers who might benefit from using a CGM? Well, possibly not, but here's one example. Athletes undergoing prolonged, moderate, or high-intensity exercise need to consume carbs while they're exercising. Absolutely false, and that just evinces your absolute misunderstanding of human physiology and health as a whole. It really does, sir. You're a general surgeon. Sit down and perform surgeries. Absolute nonsense, sir. No, you don't. 
fuel their activity. To be clear, we're talking here about people who can do endurance exercises like cycling for hours at a time. The length of exercise. How about you go and look into, I can't remember his name, his name escapes me at the moment, the person who ran five marathons in five days, one a day, while consuming nothing but water for those five days. Why don't you go talk about that guy real quick and then tell us with a straight face that you require glucose in higher intensity exercise. Go ahead. If they engage in, the intensity at which they're doing it, and where they are all play a role in determining how much glucose these individuals need. So yes, which will be produced by the liver and the proximal convoluted tubules of the kidneys via gluconeogenesis, a demand-driven process by which the body creates glucose endogenously from non-glucose precursors, amino acids, glycerol, lactate during exercise, and, of course, odd-chain fatty acids in a starvation episode. The use of a CGM could play a role in managing these calculations. But by the time an elite level athlete arrives at the point at which they need to monitor their carb intake, they're already highly trained in their sport. They've optimized their nutrition and- Look at this, optimize their nutrition. And this is what he puts on the screen here. What is this? I think this is cookie crunch, the cereal. <laughs> this is all cereal. Many other aspects of their life. And when they reach for a CGM, it will be in full knowledge of its limitations. And as always, it's what you do with the information you get from any test that really matters, not the data itself. With that in mind, what easy actions can you take to manage your blood glucose without shelling £100 a month plus for this? Stop consuming carbohydrates. Then you don't have to monitor it at all, actually, unless you're eating too much protein, which can be done with very fit and muscular men. They tend to overeat protein because they think it'll give them more of an advantage commensurate with the protein intake. But anyway, without shelling a hundred pounds a month plus for this device, let's play another quick game. Which of the following would you guess can lower blood glucose in a diabetic individual? <laughs> well, the most conducive way is to not consume carbohydrates. Eating more fiber, going for a yes, eating more fiber can lower blood glucose spikes. Yes after eating a meal that can also do it yes eating enough sleep yep that can also do it eating fats and proteins before you eat carbs that can also do it do you know what else is the most conducive way to doing such a thing that will cause you the least amount of damage from glucose not consuming the f carbs in the first place i mean seriously what the hell is wrong with people oh cyanide is toxic here's a non-lethal dose of it even though it's non-lethal i know that i shouldn't consume it but since it's in my food via industrialization instead of advocating for it to be removed from our food and our food supply to be cleaned up let's just go ahead and find a way to make it innocuous with respect to the consumption of it by combining it with something else stop eating it as you probably already realize the answer is all of them. If you uh, you forgot the most important one, which is not consuming the carbs in the first place. From diabetes, all of these options are valuable tools to help you manage your condition, and you certainly don't need to wear a CGM to tell you that. In fact, eating more fiber, going for more walks, and getting more sleep is good advice for pretty much all of us. No, so it's not. You should not be consuming fiber at all. Not giving babies tablets to keep them quiet. And while we're debunking semi-miraculous health scans- You're not debunking sh sir. All you've done is espouse nonsense with respect to carbohydrate consumption. In terms of the CGM stuff, sure, fine, but your implications are false here. Products, wouldn't it be great if you could simply pop a pill to regulate your appetite? Or, or just remove an externality already present, which is the carbohydrates in the diet. I could drink in a cute little bottle to boost your microbiome. Yes, these products actually exist and are vying with CGMs and unicorn tears for the number one spot in the health fad hall of fame as we speak. To find out more about the truth of probiotic drinks or the Ezempic weight loss injection, click on these videos to watch those next. All right, yep, so we're done there. We covered everything. The solution to blood sugar dysregulation is to not consume carbohydrates. That is your solution because that's the pathology at hand. The only time that you will ever have to monitor your blood glucose is if it's perceived to be a problem, and that can happen on carnivore if you're consuming excessive amounts of protein. So, with that being said, if you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, please subscribe to the channel, please leave your thoughts in the comment section below, and also once again, subscribe to the Patreon if you haven't already, and buy my book Contraindicated, a closer look and revision of mainstream health axioms that have perpetuated illness disorder and disease for over a century if you have not already, and also the link on the screen below. What is that? Well, that is a link that will bring you to an amazing site with amazing products from an amazing brand known as Cerule that I mentioned earlier 
earlier. If you purchase product through that link, you will get a permanent 10% discount and a permanent free shipping discount when signing up for monthly deliveries. And if you email me at edgookie14 at gmail.com behind the scenes, I can show you and tell you how to earn those products for free because who in their right mind wouldn't want that? Now, if you want to learn more about those products, which I recommend anyone and everyone do before buying anything, I would refer to the link in the top right corner of the screen, the Cerule Products link, which is a complete elucidation and explanation of what those products are, who should take them, why you should take them, when to take them, etc, etc. And I'd also further migrate to the description below to find a video between myself and Professor Bart K, wherein we explain the products in further detail, as well as the company of Cerule itself. If you are someone that would like to donate to my channel via a one-time payment rather than a recurring payment via Patreon or Cerule or something like that, then I do have those options available through a PayPal donation link and a GoFundMe donation link, which can also, both of which can be found in the description below. And also, once again, if you have any questions about anything whatsoever, I would email me at edgoki14 at gmail.com for that. And with that being said, join me next time when someone else views themselves to be as remotely competent as someone that is remotely competent to speak about human nutrition and blood glucose levels, and also someone that is so gullible enough to believe in the lipid heart hypothesis in 2024. So, till then.